So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Marek Potocher, and I work as a software engineer at Oracle. Uh, for the last decade, I've been involved with development of web services. And uh, basically six years ago, I joined Sun Micros Microsystems to work on a web services-oriented frameworks. I first joined the team of the Metro, uh, which is a SOAP web services stack, a pro, uh, open SOAP web services stack. And uh, I was responsible for uh, driving the development or leading the development of some of the components in, in, in Metro. And at the same time, I, was, I started to watch the efforts of uh, Paul Sandoz and uh, Mark Hadley uh, in their attempts to standardize some Java API for developing RESTful web services. And a couple of years later, I actually switched tracks and, and joined the Jaxares and Jersey team, um, where together with, with Mark and Paul, we've been developing uh, the web services for a while. And currently, I'm, uh, I'm the Jaxares specification lead uh, we are just about to release the next version of JaxRS, which I'm going to talk about, and I'm also a Jersey development lead, uh, which provides the reference implementation for JaxRS. Before we begin, um, the traditional Oracle um, legal slide. Actually, yesterday at the both uh, of Java E, I, I learned that this slide can be useful, especially if you are uh, if you are. Uh, a specification lead, you can promise something and then you can take it back or revisit it later. So uh, that's why I included it today. Uh, so in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I want to talk primarily about what's new and coming in uh, JaxRS and uh, what are the, also the, some of the New Jersey features uh, that you should be able to soon use in, in your, when developing the RESTful web services in Java. Uh, so, however, before I dive deep into, into these new features, uh, let me first tell you why I think that you actually should care about uh, Java RESTful or RESTful web services development in general. So, why I really care uh, or why, why, why I really think that you should be here and, 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 and uh, learn, about, learn about RESTful web services development. Um, basically, if you happen to go to, if you want to learn about the rest and, and you happen to go to some of the search engines provided by one of our uh, platinum sponsors, the DevOx, um, which is, by the way, also a RESTful web service, uh, you will sooner or later end up reading a presentation of uh, Roy Fielding, uh, uh, when, when, if you search for REST, you will soon, sooner or later end up reading the presentation, uh, the dissertation work of uh, Roy Fielding. And um, uh, provided you don't doze off after first few uh, slides, uh, obviously the presentation has some pictures, but it's in no way a comic book or any, any light reading. So if you don't doze off, you, you, will, you will eventually learn that uh, REST is an architectural style which has some, um, which basically defines some constraints that you should apply to designing your systems. And if you if you design the, if you apply those constraints, your systems should uh, actually uh, exhibit some uh, properties or or the, the, some some properties should be induced in the in that systems. So here you will learn about how the scalability impacts, uh, or sorry, how the statelessness 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 impact scalability and simplicity of your services, uh, as well as evolvability, how the uniform interface affects ev evolvability and simplicity, how cacheability improves performance and stuff like that. But if you are a common developer and, and you've been doing some service-oriented work before, you would say, okay, so that's, that's nice, but th this is something that has been promised to, to us uh, with Corba, with RMI, with uh, with SOAP. So why why the SOAP should be uh, why the rest should be different in in this case? And I think that the main difference between between those uh, technologies and, and the rest is that uh, REST has a very powerful ally, and it, it is actually HTTP. So HTTP is uh, is everywhere. Uh, it is basically the communication standard for for the web. 
and uh, as such, it is supported in most of the modern frameworks. Uh, most of the most of the languages provide the APIs that that let you send uh, send HTTP requests and and receive back uh, HTTP responses, um, as well as uh, basically it has the, the HTTP itself as a specification. Uh, it's not uh, if if you look at it as a whole, it has some issues and and basically there are some con corner cases where where you need to be careful, which you need to be careful about. However. In the core, the specification uh, is simple enough so that even even the beginner developers can can use those API to talk to to the to the HTTP endpoints. And uh, basically, this means that if you really develop a RESTful web service and you expose it over HTTP, uh, you are getting a lot of customers um, for free, actually, and, and you are getting a lot of customers on on many different platforms, even on the mobile devices. Um, because even those platforms provide you ways of manipulating HTTP. Uh, and also, you are getting also the, the interoperability with, with all these platforms. You don't really rely on, on the clients written in Java. The, the clients can be written in essentially any, any modern programming language or, or even a scripting lang language that is not type saver and dynamic. So let's have a look. And what are the options if you write the web services, um, if you want to write the RESTful web services in Java based on, on top of the HTTP protocol? Uh, basically, there are certain levels of APIs already provided in Java. And in the, top, in the bottom level, you have the APIs that really deal with the I.O. and, and, and raw data, transfer, uh, data exchange. Uh, they are processing the, the incoming data and then basically uh, are, are supposed to send whatever data you, you are giving to those APIs. Uh, th these APIs are represented typically by some HTTPIO containers, such as uh, uh, the, the one that is uh, uh, included in the Oracle JDK or the Grizzly in Etienne and so on. A um, little, bit, little bit further than that, on top of it, it is a layer of APIs that are provided by the serval specification and these APIs are uh, more HTTP oriented as well as they provide additional, uh, additional uh, facilities in, in the APIs for manipulating the request, uh, the, the HTTP requests and responses uh, and, and sessions, uh, etc. So they provide a little bit more focused way of working with HTTP, uh, especially if you are working in, in, in a Java E container or, or servlet container. Um, then the on the top, there are APIs that are truly trying to provide a way how to expose your business logic in the form of RESTful web services. And they, they take different approaches. So JAXRS is annotation-based, uh, annotation and there are some other frameworks which, which, uh, uh, which provide additional, uh, or they, they approach it differently. They provide ways of maybe uh, implementing some interfaces and exposing it this way. Uh, I'm not saying that necessarily these other two are doing that, uh, but basically there are more frameworks, and if you are a Java developer, you are not really, uh, and you want to develop a RESTful service, uh, you don't really have to use just JAXRS, you can use other frameworks. However, I'm a, a JAXRS uh, spec lead, so obviously I'm going to talk uh, about JAXRS uh, in, in this talk. Um, one more thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, uh, the more, the more REST-oriented the framework is, uh, the more uh, simple it is or to, 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 to actually expose your service as a RESTful service, as well as um, hand in hand with that comes the, the increased, increase in productivity. And uh, the RESTful framework, even if it doesn't impose any hard constraints on, 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 the, on the way you design the application, it typically does uh, impose uh, or it typically influences the way you design the application. So um, the higher level framework you use, chances are the application you design will be more restful uh, and not just an HTTP endpoint exposed uh, on the network somewhere. Okay, so I told you that I'm going to focus on JAXRS, so let's uh, have a closer look. Uh, basically, JAXRS uh, initially was designed to leverage the Java annotation facility that was introduced in, in uh, Java SE5 uh, to kind of define a DSL for mapping 
uh, between um, HTTP request and the uh, Java method that is supposed to be invoked for the, to process that request. Uh, so in a way, the, the API is obviously HTTP-centric, and uh, uh, the decision to use the annotation was also done uh, because so, so that you are not really a, you are not really as a developer forced to extend any abstract classes or implement any interfaces when you want to develop your web service when you want to develop your restful web services. So I keep saying web services, but for me, web service is really a restful service. Uh, SOAP service is for me a SOAP service basically. Uh, another advantage of uh, of uh, JAXRS is that um, since JAXRS 1.1, it's been included in Java EE, in, uh, in also in Java EE web profile, so it's part of Java EE 6, and uh, this means that if you are running on a Java EE 6 enabled container, uh, you are able to expose your services in a restful way and at the same time leverage all, all the other features that, uh, the, that the application server can provide, so all the infrastructure provided by the Java EE, including EJB, CDI, JMS, or you name it. Uh, let's, uh, let's now really have a look very quickly at how, uh, at how, how you can expose your, your POJO as a, as a Jaxar resource. I said that you are going to need some, some annotations to do that. So basically the first annotation, no, well, the, this can be a really any POJO. Uh, in the Java container, it can be also a CDI bean or, or, or EJB. Uh, so um, you are not constrained to, to, have, to have it just as a POJO. That your class can also assume additional roles. Uh, not just, uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily only a JAXRS resource. Um, so the first thing that you want to do on, on, your, on your resource is to annotate it with adpad annotation, which basically provides the mapping between the HTTP request URI and the method that is going to be invoke, in, in, in invoked, or in this case also the class or the resource that is going to be even considered for, 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 the, for, for, the, for matching the methods that should be invoked. Uh, the next thing that you want to do is uh, whenever you have a business logic that should react to some of the HTTP methods such as get, post, put, etc. you need to add additional annotation to these, uh, additional annotation to these methods, uh, basically saying that, okay, this, this method really uh, is meant to process only HTTP get requests or this other method is meant to be processed, uh, processing only HTTP post requests, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, Juxtras defines uh, an at HTTP method meta annotation which lets you provide even extensions uh, for the methods that are not part of the HTTP protocol as such, but are part of some HTTP extensions such as WebDAO. So you can, you can even create your own annotations uh, with this uh, meta annotation and then you can apply them and Juxar's runtime will understand uh, what you actually meant. So the mapping is one-to-one. -one. The name of the annotation um, in that meta annotation is then uh, basically used uh, used to map the HTTP, HTTP request method. Okay, so the next thing that you probably want to do in your resource is to constrain the, uh, the message payloads, message payload formats the resor your resource understands, uh, and you do that by uh, annotating either the class or the individual methods with the add produces or add consumes annotations. Uh, in this case, I'm basically uh, using the uh, annotations to restrict all the methods, uh, all the resource methods uh, to only uh, work with uh, application XML formats, uh, either in the, in the request payload as well as, in the, in the uh, as well as in the response payload. So this information is then uh, used for uh, matching the request uh, accept header uh, that was sent by the client and doing the content negotiation with your with your with your service by the Juxers in the Juxers runtime, so that it can tell whether you are really able to process or whether you are really able to meet the requirements that that client was uh, was uh, pose, uh, was posing on you um, by including the accept header in his request. Okay, so and the last thing, basically, you need to or you want to uh, add additional annotations that will provide the mapping between the uh, HTTP request data and your fields or method parameters. 
So in this case, basically, I'm mapping the the, the template, the, the actual value of the uh, part of the URI or part of the request URI represented by this ID template to uh, to, to to the order ID, which is in a form of a string. And uh, also, I'm saying that in, in, in the second parameter, I want to get the value which was in the request uh, HTTP for, from uh, header. And in case there is no such header, this header is not mandatory part of every HTTP request. So in, in such case, I'm saying that the default value for this parameter should be set to unknown. So Juxner is one that though if you are developing web services today, that's what you are probably using. Uh, it provides also um, additional stuff uh, that, uh, that helps you develop your uh, RESTful services. And, and basically, um, one of the things is uh, uh, additional injectable information that you, can, that you can use. And you can either inject into your resource fields or resource methods to, to, to get more information about the, the actual uh, request data. Um, as well as um, in case you want to somehow customize the response, uh, there, is a, there, is, there, is a, there are facilities for full customization of the response data you are returning, including all the status header, status uh, uh, code headers and, uh, and the customization of the message payload. Uh, and you can do that dynamically. Uh, also, uh, additional, uh, additional extension point is the, are, are the message content handlers that basically let you Extend the extend the default payload that are understand by or that are mandated by the JAXA spec to be understand by each JAXA runtime implementation. So you can extend these default uh, default formats understood by uh, that are understood with, with the new additional formats uh, that that may be even completely custom to your to your use case. It doesn't have to be necessarily any. A standard media type you can you, you are free to uh, provide any extension you want uh, as well as uh, you are able to uh, you are able to, mm, to 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 plug in your own custom way of dealing with uh, application exceptions uh, so whenever something bad happens, application exception is raised uh, you have a way uh, by using the exception mapper. Uh, by, by plugging in the custom exception mapper to actually provide your own custom processing for uh, how the exception is being mapped to the actual response that, 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 is, that, that is then sent to the client. So instead of just sending the typical or default uh, 400, uh, HTTP 400 response or uh, HTTP 500 response in certain cases, uh, you, you are free to basically choose what, what, the, what, what the response actually will be, what, what the exception will be mapped to. Uh, and so on. We have we have additional uh, we have additional more advanced uh, parts of the API that let you do some some other interesting things. Uh, I don't want to go into the detail uh, because, as I promised, I would like to focus on on the future stuff that uh, that you should expect to see quite soon. So it will be released in in a couple of well, not in a couple, in a few months, uh, with uh, as part of the Java E7 and um, it will be supported in uh, Jersey as the reference implementation, Jersey to the DAO as the reference implementation, as, as well as I know that uh, some other um, vendors are working on their implementation to support the JAXRS as soon as, uh, JAXRS to the DAO uh, features as soon as possible. So just quickly a glimpse of what, what, what are the main new things that are coming in. We are basically adding the new client API that was um, simply missing, and this is one of the biggest biggest uh, weaknesses of the current uh, Juxers API. Uh, asynchronous processing, uh, both on the server and the client side. Uh, then some mm, filters and interceptors, which are there to uh, provide some more advanced, uh, uh, or to, to, to serve the more advanced use cases, and, and maybe, maybe are not targeted as, an, as, uh, as a day-to-day -day, um, RESTful service developer. Uh, they, are, they are maybe more uh, targeted at uh, someone who provides uh, like m more encapsulated features or facilities that uh, should be uh, pluggable into the Juxer's runtime, uh, such as cache caching and, and um, encoding, encoding, decoding, and stuff like that. Uh, the configuration features are another uh, and, uh, are another area that I want to cover, and this is basically uh, also a way for library providers or feature providers to, to have a standard way of exposing their 
um, or enabling their features on not only a single implementation. Uh, so they, uh, th th this is the way. Uh, this is th th these. Uh, these APIs should help them to expose their uh, features um, in an interoperable way so that the features should, be, should, should work also on multiple vendors. So we don't have, have to have the same feature on, on Jersey and a different on the REST EZ. Um, you, you should be able to write the feature in a way that it, it runs on both and, and provides the, the same functionality on both. And there are some other areas that we are improving. Uh, I, I'll see if I have enough time to, to get into them. Uh, there is a lot of content to cover. So um, let's start with the client API. Basically, as I said, it's one of the things that was completely missing from, from 1.0, uh, and there was a reason for that. But uh, obviously, if you, want, if you already expose a service, you want to access it somehow, and, and typically, um, Mm, you, what, you, what you are doing is you either have a use case where you just want to send a single GET request and get, at, and get back a single response, or you want to really be involved in, in, a, in a longer interaction, as well as the, you may want to access multiple of, of these endpoints, and uh, each of these endpoints may, pro, may require different implementation, uh, sorry, different configuration. So uh, basically, um, when we looked at all that, we came up with a, with a fluent, with something which we call fluent API, where you basically start with bootstrapping the client, um, bootstrapping with the client runtime, and then you basically fluently are able to uh, to proceed until you actually get a response in in a single flow of method invocations. Uh, this is to satis satisfy the simple use cases, but as well we wanted to make the API. Uh, flexible enough and, and, and really uh, usable well enough to also satisfy the more advanced use cases such as the ones that I said, uh, being able to uh, share the configuration between the different um, services and inherit the configuration and, and update the configuration for the different uh, uh, actual endpoints that you are eventually going to send requests to. So um, as I said, we uh, in the end arrived to, to, to Fluent API, which is a low level based on the URI templates and uh, allows for configuration inheritance and uh, uh, specialization of, of the, of the uh, client side. URI, URI components or client-side counterparts to your RESTful service endpoints. Uh, the main components is, uh, is uh, the, the, basically the main component uh, for, for the bootstrapping is the client factory, uh, which you use to actually create a client instance with, that represents the actual client runtime. And the uh, client then can hold the common configuration for all the for all the endpoints that you are going to access uh, or create access to using that client instance. And then the next component, which is a web target, is actual representation of, of, the, of the endpoint or even a set, set of the endpoints. Uh, if you use the template, if you don't use the actual URI, if you use the template, you can have a one target representing a set of the uh, same endpoints in the, ca in the same category. So in a way, it, we can say it's a, it's a glorified URI. Actually, it's very similar to URI Builder, uh, which we have in the JAXRS 1.0 uh, uh, with, with the addition of being able to actually send requests to, to, to the URI that is represented by that, by that target. And at the same time, the target is still the configurable, as well as any other component up to the, send, up to the request. So how does it look like? As I said, you start with the client, and uh, uh, you start with the, with the client factory and, and create a new client instance. And from that client instance, uh, you basically create a web target. In this case, I'm, I'm basically creating a target for the resource I was showing uh, previously. And uh, from that web target, I'm deriving another target, which um, if I, if I did, uh, did provide some configuration for the orders target, I would, uh, that configuration would be shared with the new target. So I didn't, in this case, I'm just deriving the new target. And once I have the final target, I can just resolve, uh, resolve um, the target that was currently represented as a, as a template. So it represented basically any order. I can resolve that, that um, that template to, to the actual um, single resource order. And uh, 
I, I, I say, I, I will tell, I will tell the, I will start, start, start building the requests by telling what, what uh, data I'm able to consume, uh, what uh, in, in this request method I'm, st I'm actually saying what, what will be the content of my HTTP accept header, and then I'm directly invoking the, the get method on the target, uh, and the, in, in this get method I'm specifying in what format I ex on, in, in what Java type I expect the mes response message payload to be sent back. So similarly, if I want to se send something, which if I don't want to just send the get request and retrieve the data, I can I can also I can also send some data, obviously as part of the as part of the uh, HTTP request to the to the server. So in this case, I'm uh, I'm accessing the orders target uh, defined on the previous page, and uh, I'm actually invoking the post method, and I'm specifying that I want to send my new order and it will be sent in the XML format, and uh, I want to receive a response as a text plane. And this time I'm not specifying what payload, response payload type I want to respond, and if I don't do that, basically uh, what the API will return me is a response object, which is, um, which is the same response as you would probably know from uh, JAXRS 1.0, uh, at least those of you who've worked with JAXRS already, and uh, it was just updated to support some of the some of the client side use cases um, uh, which i 'm going to show quickly so basically, if I get the response i can I have the information about the whole response data available to me uh, the, I can get the information about the status I can then uh, decide to read the entity uh, into into a string or into whatever uh, whatever java type uh, the I have I have the the message body handlers for, and uh, also we are adding some support for uh, for uh, doing uh, uh, for working with links. So I can access I can see if there are any links uh, in the response headers, and uh, if there is a link uh, with the relation type uh, that I'm that I'm interested in, I can get the link, and then I can directly use the link to basically create a new target and follow with additional requests. So basically in this case I would probably um, I place the order, so what I would want to do is to get, get the resource that I should access to, to pay for the order, to complete the order, and uh, basically what I want to do is to send a request to it and somehow complete the order and pay for it so that it's, um, so that I can wait for a package to arrive or anything. <clears throat> okay, so uh, as for the configuration, as I told, uh, you can configure essentially all the main components of the client API, including uh, the uh, if, including after you start building the, your requests. Uh, but typically, what you what you end up doing is to configure either the client or, or the web target. So in this case, uh, well, if you if you played with the JAXRS to the API two weeks ago, you may wonder where is the dot configuration, which which disappeared uh, in the last two weeks. So basically, we re-evaluated re the API and, and, and made it even more fluent. So currently, you can, you can directly use the configuration methods on the actual, actual component, um, whether it's a client or payment. And in, in this case, I'm actually adding some configuration because uh, it seems that the payment target will require some authentication. Uh, and uh, maybe I want to log uh, all the payment all the payment requests that I'm doing so I'm adding some audit logger filter uh, and I'm setting some property which will be probably read by the uh, by that uh, audit logger filter to full so that I get the all so so that I get uh, so that I get log all the information um, by the audit logger and then I'm proceeding with issuing the request and, and actually doing the same thing as as, as uh, as we did in the previous slides. Uh, so that's that's all okay. So so far it was a synchronous API, um, but sometimes when you when you are when you are waiting when you are sending a request to a resource that may need to itself wait to 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 some external event to happen, uh, you will be actually blocked on the client side without actually being able to do anything while the response comes. So. Uh, in this case, I'm trying to I'm trying to get some message from the from the messenger 
um, resource. However, um, if the message is not available there, nobody posted any message there, I will be waiting for a long time and I will, I'll be wasting the resources on the client side. So it, re it would be really good to be able to do something uh, in, while waiting for, that, for the response to come. So one way to, to do that in the client API is to use the is to use the pool model or the future-based async client API, and uh, basically all the all the async API is being available by just simply including one single async method into the Fluent flow, and that that method basically magically changes the API from the synchronous to asynchronous. Instead of working with the direct types, you are working with the futures, or you are able to to register callbacks for uh, for for the uh, for, for the future response to arrive. So in this case, I'm working with the future, and while I still don't have the response back for the server, I am able to do something, and once the, once the response is av available, I'm going to uh, just display the message by, uh, in, but by invoking the future get on, 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 the, on the response. Another way how to work with the asynchronous API is to register uh, something which we call invocation callback. And in that invocation callback, you are implementing methods that will be invoked uh, uh, when, the, when, the, when the request is, success is successfully finished with the response. And uh, either the completed method is invoked when everything went fine, uh, so then you, then you will be able to proceed and display the message, or the failed method is is invoked to inform you, uh, to inform you if anything got wrong if anything went wrong and again i just um, i just in this case i'm just firing the request and, and registering the callback that will be invoked asynchronously and i can proceed with doing something else so this basically um, brings us uh, also to the problem of uh, how to handle such asynchronous services on the server side because this is not only a problem on, of the, on the client side. And uh, basically, mm, very often uh, in, in modern applications, there are some, and typically which are browser-based or Ajax applications, you have, a, you have a client opening a connection to the server and then just waiting for some events to come. So if you do it synchronous, if you handle this synchronously on the server side, what you're uh, end up doing is that you are occupying uh, uh, for for each uh, client connection you are uh, spawning a new thread or, or op occupying a separate thread on the server side and uh, uh, while or originally the problem was that in the end you you've been spawning too many threads in in the most new frameworks you are actually going to run out of the threads because most of the new frameworks are not spawning threads uh, the IO containers are currently use, reusing the limited set of threads, and uh, uh, once you once you occupy all of them, you are not able to process any more client connections. So uh, maybe just to quickly show you what I mean by that, uh, I have that uh, I have here a very, very simple application, and maybe let's first have a look. I'm let's let's first have a look at the resource that is behind there. So. I have a I have a sync echo method which basically does a sleep for one second and then returns the the whatever whatever um, message it was sent to and then I have the async method uh, async method which is using the new asynchronous API and I, I'm now going a little bit um, uh, fast so I will obviously uh, de describe this API uh, later but just to give you a feel what what I'm talking about so this is a these are two methods that are basically doing the same thing one is synchronous and one is asynchronous and then I have this client which uh, which I can configure to send like let's say 30 requests and uh, I can send it synchronously to the running Glassfish instance where the, where the resource is deployed to. So what you will see is that uh, the requests I'm sending are represented as uh, squares, and while, while they are yellow, they are basically waiting on the client side to be completed. When, they, when, they, when the server returns back a response, they will turn green. If the server would fail for some reason, the square would uh, turn red. So let's look, what, what, let's, uh, look at... Uh, what does it? Uh, what does this service do if I access, if I access it uh, with 30 simultaneous clients from um, from the from this application? And I should tell you that um, by default, Glassfish is configured to have only five 
uh, to have only five uh, I/O threads for, for processing the request. So obviously, when I'm going to once I'm going to saturate those five threads, uh, I will see that no no more uh, no more requests are are being able to process. So let's let me hit run. Basically, um, I send the request, and you can see that slowly those requests are being completed and they are really being completed in a chunks of five because only five requests can be sleeping at the same time. So let me do the same with the asynchronous uh, version of the method which basically offloads the processing to a completely different thread and thus releases the IO thread from actually, uh, from actually having to wait for the response to complete. So again, I'm sending the request, and as you can see, I was able to receive the response essentially at the same time. And this is because the wait didn't happen in the I/O thread; it was offloaded, and and the, this way that, that that was supposed to simulate the long processing was offloaded to a completely different thread pool that was dedicated for for doing that long running processing. So if we if we issued more requests, we would see even even more dramatic difference between the performance of of these two approaches. Okay, so let me go back to the slides. Uh, so I, I, I hope that you now understand what I, what I mean when I'm telling that, when I'm telling you that whenever, whenever you have a long-running operation or, or, or operation that requires an external, e waiting for an external event so that, uh, so that you are able to send back a response, it is not a good, good idea to process such uh, operation or execute such operation synchronously as a synchronous service. And that's actually why, why we have the asynchronous uh, services or asynchronous services API added in, in JaxRS to the DAO to actually uh, foc add, add support for just these use cases without our users having to do any other hacks, having to do any other hacks. So what we did is that we are uh, creating a concept of the async response, which is a similar to the asynchronous co async context API in the servlet. And, uh, the, the idea is that we need to be able to represent the suspended connection which is de detached from the, from the IO container thread. So when the request comes, we don't, want, uh, we don't want the container to think that we are going to send back the response on, that, on, that, on the same thread. We, we want to let him know that, uh, okay, so give me the suspended connection which is detached from the thread and I will just uh, send the response back from any other thread. So basically, we have, we have obviously uh, exposed the APIs for resuming or canceling uh, the suspended connections, as well as we have support for, for some lifecycle callbacks so that you know uh, or you, you get informed about changes in the states of, 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 of this asynchronous response. The at suspended annotation is the, uh, actually, scobic injection marker, and that way, basically, we are trying to hint you that the only way uh, the only place where you should be able injecting the async response uh, instances is the actual um, HTTP method parameter. So this way we were able to kind of uh, uh, prevent some of the possible, uh, possible issues or er early errors when working with the API. Uh, the ID would basically yell at you whenever you wanted to inject it into a field or anything other than uh, the message parameter. So I said that the uh, async, async, connect, async response has, some, has to go through some states, and uh, yeah, so it's visible. Uh, the, um, basically, you start with a, with, a, with a connection in a running state, and it's suspended, and uh, um, it, can, it can either be resumed, in which case it will, be, uh, it, it will, go, it will go through the responding and completed phases, uh, or it can it can time out in which case you, you can register a timeout handler that will uh, let you uh, deal with the timeout event and you can either resuspend the connection again so move it to the suspended back to the suspended state you can you can or you can uh, resume or cancel the connection and basically move it to the responding and completed state and uh, when the response is completed the completion callback would be invoked uh, which is uh, which is which is one of the callbacks that we are uh, that we are supporting. Another callback, uh, which uh, which we still are not sure if we will be able to support uh, in all environment or optionally is the connection callback, and that callback is there to 
actually notify you that the client closed the connection. But uh, unfortunately, it turns out that in Java there is no really good or reliable way how to find out about this event. So, uh, well, we will see how it turns out. Definitely we are going to support it in some way. Uh, maybe it will be just optional. Okay, so um, as you saw the previous method, uh, this is kind of a similar method. I'm, I'm, I, have a, I have a messenger resource that I was trying to access in, in the previous uh, client-side example. And uh, I'm defining the resource method, the get message, which injects the asynchronous response. And in this, uh, and in this method, I'm actually uh, setting my own default timeout handler to handle the timeout events. I'm also saying, okay, so any, any, connection, that, any, any connection that wasn't served by, by 15 seconds, I'm going to uh, just invoke, the time, uh, I'm going to timeout. So the timeout, timeout handler will have to decide what's going to happen next. Uh, and uh, then I'm just putting the, the, this connection to the, to the queue. Uh, and in the other method, which actually receives some messages from other clients possibly, uh, which is and reacts to the HTTP posts, in, in this other method I'm actually taking the suspended connections uh, from, from a queue if there are any, and I'm resuming them with the message that was sent by additional client. So this is actually the, this is actually the other use case. So uh, in the previous example, we saw a use case where the, where the op operation took a long time. Uh, this, this is another large set of, uh, la uh, another use case re representing large group of use cases where the response you need to provide is dependent on external event to come. In this case, uh, another request from, from a different client, perhaps. All right, so any questions so far? Or maybe we can leave the questions to the end. Okay, if not, let's switch gears and uh, let's uh, briefly discuss the, uh, another concept which we are adding and filtering, in, uh, which is the filters and interceptors. Uh, filters and interceptors are um, kind of, well, basically both are interceptors and both are meant to intercept uh, uh, HTTP request or response in some way. The, the, as I said earlier, these are basically meant uh, f to cover some more advanced use cases and um, maybe welcome addition for anybody who is writing a library of features for, for RESTful services or um, basically any, uh, any developers that need to deal with these, uh, with these additional advanced use cases or, or want to want to provide some aspect-oriented processing to the requests and responses. Um, the filters and interceptors are both introduced on the client and the server APIs. Uh, the interceptors are being reused, so we have the same interfaces being used on the server and the client. Uh, as for the filters, we have a, speci a specialized set of, uh, set of interfaces uh, on, the, on the filters and then the uh, on the server side and then specialized set of interfaces on the client side. The, obviously, this concept is nothing new. Um, basically, essentially, all major vendors already provide it uh, similarly to the client API, as well as, uh, in this case, um, many major vendors provided already some proprietary support. So, um, basically, the goal, is, uh, goal here is to look at what they are all providing, to unify it somehow, and come up with a one standard default API that can be used by the developers, regardless of the implementation that they, they work with. So, as for the filters, uh, they are really meant to, uh, to handle uh, the requests or responses in terms of the looking at the headers or changing, or changing, the, changing their values, looking at the HTTP request method and maybe modifying that, um, or adding some additional headers to the responses and uh, those, those type of use cases, that, that's the primary role of the filter. These filters are invoked by the runtime in a way that one filter is invoked, it, it does its job, then it returns, the next filter is invoked, does its job, it returns, and so on, until the last filter in the chain is invoked, uh, which means that uh, what we call this approach is that it's non-wrapping. It means that the filter itself is not trying to invoke the rest of the filter chain. Uh, and that's the, also one of the main differences to, to the interceptors, and I'll get to it later. So very simple example of, of, uh, of a logging filter. 
for for the requests on the on the on the on the server side, basically uh, you are implementing an interface and uh, you you are implementing the method in that interface that takes in the request context, which is a mutable representation of the of the HTTP request that you are filtering, which means that you are able to read the data about the request, but at the same time, if you if you want or have to, you you can modify this data. And in this case, I'm just passing this uh, request to some logger method that will that will log the the, the request somewhere somehow uh, as for the interceptors as i said the, one of the one of the differences is that they are wrapping and uh, unlike filters they are not intercepting every request they are just intercepting a uh, serialization or deserialization of a message payload if the serialization of, the, of this or deserialization doesn't occur. Interceptors are not even invoked, which actually means that there is some performance boost. You are not going to invoke the interceptor that is supposed to, um, let's say, zip or sign or decrypt or encrypt your data or decrypt your data unless um, the business logic really requires that payload. And that, that way you are saving the time that would be otherwise wasted completely if we do it every, 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 if we do it for every request. So um, these interceptors are intercepting the message body reader, uh, read, read from or message body writer, write to methods, and they are as such wrapping. The, intercept, the top level interceptor calls the context proceed, which in turn invokes the next interceptor in the chain and until the last interceptor is being invoked, in which case uh, actually the, either the reader or writer uh, is, is actually invoked. And uh, once, once, the, once that happens, the, uh, all the call stack is basically unwinded and all, and all the interceptors have basically uh, are given another change to do something or are notified about about the the, the interception actually happened. So it's very similar to a CDI uh, method interceptors with, with the around invoke. Uh, basically, uh, here is an example of a GZIP interceptor that basically uh, implements the around read from method. And uh, when 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 the event comes and and the payload is is being read by either the client or the server side, uh, the this interceptor is being invoked as part of the interceptor chain, and it basically takes the original input context and replaces it with a new one, uh, which, which already contains the unzipped data. And then it invokes the rest of the chain. Uh, again, this is the, where, where we call, what we call wrapping. And once, once, the, once all the other interceptors are invoked and the payload is being unmarshaled, uh, then um, basically the stack unwinds and, the, uh, and this interceptor is able to set back the old content stream and basically just return. So obviously, maybe you are wondering, okay, so I have all these interceptors. I have the uh, interceptor or filter that does the security stuff. I have the I have an interceptor or filter that does some header processing. So how the, how, how, how the hell I'm supposed to order them? So obviously um, we, we, had to, we had to answer that question already to, to the expert group and the answer was to, to come up with an additional ad binding priority annotation that you can attach to your uh, filters and interceptors. And then you can specify the numeric pr priority. Uh, and we also defined kind of a, several constants that uh, that are that that could be used for for the most common use cases. So we we have uh, the the topmost priority we, we've given to the authentication, then the authorization, then whatever filters or filters that, or interceptors that are dealing with headers are being invoked, um, and entity coding are the are the next in the chain, and then the last one is something like a user level. So all these interceptors that or filters which which don't, don't really want to work with um, something, some infrastructure stuff such as dealing with security or encryption decryption uh, should, be, should be using this user level and they will be executed in, in undefined order unless you basically override the uh, actual priority with, with a particular concrete number and you assign the unique number to each of these. Uh, 
Also, on the server side, we, well, on the client side, it's pretty simple. What we saw already, you have the configuration and you are just able to register all the filters, interceptors, and essentially any providers with the particular client or the, or the target instance you are working, working with. But uh, it's not as simple on the server side. You, are, you have no such facility. So what we came up with is, uh, is the, is, are the two ways of binding the filters and, 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 uh, uh, and interceptors to, to the actual methods. We have the static binding, which is represented by the at name binding annotation. And we have a dynamic binding when, where the uh, developer can actually decide uh, during, the develop, uh, during the deployment are whether, whether a filter or interceptor should be bound, bound to a method or not. Uh, by default, if you, if you don't use any of these two, uh, of, of these two mechanisms, uh, basically the uh, filters and interceptors will be considered global and, and as such will be applied to every request and response. Uh, there is also a special annotation on the server side, which is at pre-match, uh, which basically means that the filter or inter interceptor should be invoked even before you actually are trying to match a request to the resource method. And this is essentially useful if you, if you let's say, want to change the, uh, if you have a client that can only send the get and post and you want to, s and you have a resource that actually accepts put, so you can basically use this filter, uh, use this pre-matching filter to change the method name from post uh, based on some query parameters or some additional data to the put so that it is pro properly matched to the actual resource. Okay, so basically, um, just, just a, brief, a br brief example about how, how the name binding annotation works. It's uh, very similar to the interceptor, uh, to the CDI at interceptor binding annotation. You basically use that annotation to define your own tag or your own uh, annotation, in this case, at locked. And then you apply this at locked annotation to your filter that, was, that is supposed to be bound uh, with that annotation. So this is the first step. And in the next step, you actually take the same annotation, the at locked, and you apply it to either a class or a method that, um, that the filter uh, should be should be bound to. So this is kind of an indirect way how to, how you can how you can create the binding between the field, uh, static binding between the filter and the method. Uh, if you want to do something more dynamic, uh, you can um, you can uh, you can basically use the dynamic feature, which uh, which is an interface. It's a meta provider invoke and deploy time for basically for essentially every single discovered root resource method and. Uh, it, uh, it, basically has an it basically has an interface where the information about the particular method is being passed to, as well as the configuration uh, context of that method. And uh, the dynamic feature can actually use that configuration con context to, to manipulate the configuration of, of the method uh, and uh, possibly add the additional, additional filters or providers. So, uh, an example of, of such feature could be a security feature that basically uh, extracts the information about a throw sellout annotation, uh, which may be available on, on a method. And if that uh, information is actually not null, which means that the, the annotation is present there, the feature will actually pre-compute or pre-create the filter with the pre-computed information about what are the roles allowed and it will register the roles allowed filter that will be pro probably, um, in this case, responsible for checking whether, whether the client that is issuing the request is in the role that is required by the method. Okay, so I think I'm running slightly out of time, so let me skip these additional slides. Uh, and let's briefly look at the. Okay, so let's let's briefly look at the feature. If you want to learn more about, uh, if you want to learn more about this additional Jaxar stuff, I will be having a buff at seven uh, at seven o'clock today, and uh, um, please come and have a, and, and 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 I can I can basically continue with the presentation. I can I can I can answer your questions if you have any. So let me very quickly look at uh, at least some of the features in, in what we are bringing in Jersey. 
basically in, in Jersey to the Dow, on top of the RI, we are providing also support for servers and events. Servers and events is a, is a very simple protocol which, in which you can send basically, you can open a connection from the client side and then just keep it open and uh, uh, you, can, you can then send you can then send the events uh, chunk uh, events in the in the chunks uh, on the, on these open connections from the server and consume this event separately on the client side so for this we have we have basically apis exposed for both the server and the client side and basically just on the on the example let me show you how it works we have a we have a we have a get method that basically represents or represents the new client connection trying to, trying to receive the events uh, the this this get method this gets get message stream basically creates a new event output that is representing the open connection and register that event output with the broadcaster uh, which is another api that we are using to to serve the to to serve the to serve all the events later and then we return that event out back to the client which which means that the jersey framework we will know that it should uh, it should not close the close the connection uh, to the, to the client and just keep it open and and serve the events to the client so then in the other method we are basically um, receiving some message and when we receive a message we basically create an outbound event from that message and uh, uh, send it to send the built event to the broadcaster uh, to, so that it can be broadcasted to all the uh, to all the to, to all the clients that are that are registered with the broadcaster and uh, basically the last thing I want to show you is that uh, there is also the client model where you can either uh, work with the event source which is very similar to the SSE event source standardized by W3C as part of the uh, JavaScript API or you can you can actually use also the pool model where, where you are getting the event input and then you are get, basically pulling the the events from the input and once you are done working with it you can you can you can even close so there are additional features such as dynamic resource definition um, which i unfortunately don't have time to to go through or we also provide the standard dependency injection support in jersey but again uh, unfortunately i ran out of time so I think, do we have any time for the questions? Okay, not really. I will be here. Okay, go on. So why is it, the question is why is it, why, why do we need filters in JAX service if there are filters in server specification? Yeah. Basically, uh, the thing is that with, with, uh, when you are working with JAX ser services, you are working, no, uh, the, the JAX service is not bound to the servlet container. So basically, even, even Jersey as well as JAX service, you can deploy outside of the servlet container and you probably still want to be able to filter the requests and responses. And uh, uh, we also f found that we not only need the filters, we also needed the interceptors to, to, be, to, to really satisfy all the use cases. Uh, but I think th th this is also for the longer discussion, so let's take it offline and maybe we can, we can discuss offline. Okay, anyway, thank you very much for attending.